American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today, we're talking about the Philadelphia Nativist Riots of 1844. Anti Catholicism had been a constant in the United States since English settlers first started arriving in the 16th century. But this series of riots stands out for a number of reasons. Right. The new nation had guaranteed religious liberty in the very first amendment to the Constitution, but Catholics still didn't quite experience it in practice. So these riots stood out for how destructive and bloody they were. And the agitation that led to them happened because many in the dominant Protestant society had started to feel threatened. The sheer number of Catholics in the country had grown significantly, which made them a more significant political body. Plus, more and more Catholics were ascending the social ladder. So they weren't just easily ignored as the scum laborers. So you had Protestants who wanted to keep the Catholics down and Catholics who were not willing to be kept down. This presented a powder keg. But the spark that set it all off was something that might sound very strange to a modern mind. It was the use of the Bible in the public school. To be exact, the use of the Protestant King James Version of the Bible. Public schools were still a new thing at the time, and though they were funded with public dollars, they were generally run by religious leaders. That meant Protestant ministers made the decisions at the schools. The Bible was used as a textbook in the schools because the people believed. So the motivation for using the Bible in the public school wasn't purely religious indoctrination, it was also civic. Exactly. Now, The Protestants running things didn't miss the opportunity to weave their anti-Catholic lines, but the ostensible purpose was to teach good morality. And since these were Protestants running things, and even though the King James Version did include the Deuterocanonicals, those books that Protestants call the Apocrypha, the Bibles used were the Protestant Version, so they were missing those seven Old Testament books. So this arrangement didn't sit well with the growing Catholic population, which was mostly Irish and poor at this time. By and large, they did not have the money to afford private education, and the Diocese of Philadelphia didn't have the money to establish its own parochial schools. So the Catholic families who wished their children to be educated were forced to send their kids to the public schools, and the tension mounted. Philadelphia's bishop, Francis Kenrick, himself an Irish immigrant, took on the problem by asking the school administrators to allow the Catholic children to use the Catholic Douay Reims Bible rather than the Protestant KJV. So a different translation and with all the books. Right. Bishop Kenrick also asked that the schools formally drop those parts of the lessons that were outright Protestant indoctrination and that they ban the use of anti-Catholic hymns. He finally requested that if those conditions couldn't be met in the short term, perhaps the religious portion of the curriculum should just be set aside entirely until a lesson plan acceptable to both Catholics and Protestants could be worked out. After all, he reasoned, Catholics were citizens too, so their rights were protected by the First Amendment. If public dollars were going to be spent on any religious education, it could not be in favor of Protestants over Catholics. It was an entirely reasonable request. Somewhat surprisingly, and to their credit, the official answer from the school board was to accept his proposals— They didn't have an immediate change of curriculum, but they allowed that students whose parents objected to the use of the Protestant Bible should be exempted. This official response didn't necessarily trickle down in practice, however. No, many of the school leaders and teachers didn't change their approach. Also, more ominously, this arrangement and the bishop's argument really didn't sit well with a large number of the Protestants in Philadelphia. To their minds, they were the real Americans. They had been born in the U.S., while most of these Catholics were immigrants or children of immigrants. And of course, these Catholics were subject to the Pope, a European monarch, so they couldn't possibly be good citizens in a democratic republic, you know. And now they objected to good Protestant religious instruction and insisted on using their own Bible in schooling. You know, the nerve. And again, to make matters worse from these Protestant perspectives... Some of the Catholics were climbing the social ladder, maybe only slightly, but some of them had achieved a bit of success and so were firmly now in the middle class. And that particular problem came home to roost very neatly in this Bibles in the Schools question 
because while the individuals who ran and taught at most of the public schools were good, respectable Protestants, the director of public schools at the time was a man named Hugh Clark. Clark was an immigrant from Dublin, Ireland, and he was Catholic. Disaster. I know, right? So even if the decision to allow Catholics to use their own Bibles was the right decision from the perspective of the American ideal, many Protestants saw this as a terrible betrayal. Exactly. The threat of Catholics gaining rights and political ascendancy caused lots of Protestants in the 1830s and early 1840s all over the U.S. to form movements and political parties that went by a number of different names. They were called nativists, Americanists, and the know-nothings, and they formed various groups, associations, and political parties. Their political aim was the exclusion of Catholics from equality and thereby from power. One particular policy they sought was requiring that immigrants be residents for 21 years before they could become citizens and prohibiting immigrants from ever holding public office. Their goals were generally political, and they worked through the political process But they also use intimidation and violence to try to keep the Catholics from reaching too high. We talked, for instance, about the tarring and feathering of Father John Baptist in Maine by Know Nothings in episode 51. And many of these groups gained popularity and started amassing members all over the place, particularly in cities like Philadelphia. And all of that buildup brings us to the riots of 1844. Yes. One of those nativist political groups, the American Republican Association, was growing in Philadelphia, and they wanted to expand more broadly throughout the city. So on May 3rd, 1844, that group held a public meeting in a square in the Kensington neighborhood north of downtown Philadelphia. Kensington was a heavily Irish and Catholic part of town. It was home to Hugh Clark, his parents and his siblings, and it was where a number of his and his family's business interests had their places of work. There was no mistaking the provocative nature of this choice of location for the meeting. The meeting began and the crowd started to gather, plenty of Protestants, but also a fair enough number of Catholics. Not all of the Protestants in the city were anti-Catholic, not even most of them really, and not many of the Catholics were interested in violence, but there were enough of the bad sort on both sides And the rhetoric was sufficiently hateful that eventually a group of Irishmen who'd had enough stormed the stage, forcing the nativist assembly to flee. The Irishmen tore apart the makeshift stage that had been erected and took the busted up boards home for firewood. You'd hope or wish that such a result would convince the nativists to cut out the direct provocation. But no such luck. None at all. In fact, they immediately resolved to reassemble at the exact same place three days later and they invited more to join them. They ran posts in the papers stating that their purpose was to express their indignation at the outrage of Friday evening last and to take the necessary steps to prevent a repetition of it. Natives, be punctual and resolve to sustain your rights as Americans firmly but moderately. Yeah, and whoever ran the ad was either duplicitous, ignorant, or an idealist. He certainly wasn't realist. The second gathering on May 6 was reportedly 10 times the size of the first, with both sides having many more people. This time, just as tensions were beginning to boil over, a rainstorm forced the nativists to retreat into the public marketplace to continue their meeting. The Irish Catholics, who were just beginning to insist that the gentlemen depart the locality, if you will, followed them, throwing bricks and rocks and engaging in a melee. Eventually, some Catholic, no one was quite sure who, fired a few shots from a musket and one of the blasts killed one of the nativists. The fighting continued with the nativists pinned in the marketplace. Eventually, some other nativists showed up with their own muskets and pistols and helped the trapped nativists escape. But in the course of the escape, the nativists attacked and ransacked multiple Catholic houses and businesses. That night, the nativist leaders held a council to discuss avenging the wounded and dead. The next day, May 7th, Bishop Kenrick had placards hung around the city that read the following. To the Catholics of the city and county of Philadelphia, the melancholy riot of yesterday, which resulted in the death of several of our fellow beings, calls for our deep sorrow. It becomes all who have had any share in this tragical scene to humble themselves before God and to sympathize deeply and sincerely with those whose relatives and friends have fallen. I earnestly conjure all to avoid all occasions of excitement and to shun public places of assemblage and to do nothing that in any way can exasperate. 
Follow peace with all men, with charity, without which no man can see God. Whether or not any Catholics heeded Bishop Kenrick's call for peace, it certainly wasn't heeded by the nativist mob that gathered near Independence Hall on May 7th. Anti-Catholic leaders whipped the crowd into a frenzy of revenge and hate and then marched them north toward Kensington. The clash was horrific. Irish residents fought back. It's tough to say how many were aggressors in disobedience to Bishop Kenrick's plea, but plenty were doing so out of self-defense. The destruction was massive. Between May 7 and May 9, somewhere between 30 and 60 homes and businesses owned by Catholics were torched, along with the firehouse, the Hibernia Hose Company. Perhaps the two most significant losses were two parish churches. The first to go up was St. Michael, which was very near the site of the original meeting. It was torched on May 8th, despite the militia having been called out to stop the mob. Apparently, the militia was told to prevent people being injured or killed, but not to interfere in property damage, so the people didn't fear the militia's presence. Then the mob moved on, vowing to burn down other Catholic churches. They set their sights on one of the most significant ones, St. Augustine. St. Augustine was nearer to the city center. Built in 1801, it was the largest Catholic church in the city with a spire designed by the same man who designed the spire on Independence Hall. Among its founding donors was Commodore John Barry, the Irish Catholic immigrant known as the father of the U.S. Navy. We talked about him in episode 15. Another founding donor was George Washington. There are many examples of Washington being friendly towards Catholics. We talked twice before about it, first in episode 52, when we talked about his Catholic aide-de-camp, John Fitzgerald, and again when we talked about Pope Night in episode 69. St. Augustine was surrounded by the mob. This time, the mayor of the city, who was himself Protestant but not anti-Catholic, stood on the stairs of the church and implored the mob to stop the rampage and spare St. Augustine. His words were to no avail. Someone managed to get inside and start a blaze. St. Augustine went up in flames. The mob also torched the rectory, and with it, one of the finest theological libraries in the country. Emboldened, they then moved on toward the fairly new Cathedral of St. John near City Hall. But this time, the militia led by General George Cadwallader, made it clear that the cannon he had emplaced at St. John would not allow that church to be touched. St. John was spared, but the mob continued into May 10th, only stopping when significantly more forces opposed it, including citizen posses, police and militia raised in other cities, and the Federal Army. In the aftermath, the official counts of the carnage counted only between 15 and 20 people dead, with only two of them officially being Irish. But the official count was reported by city officials who, in the aftermath, were eager to pin the blame on the Irish Catholics for political reasons. There is no accounting for however many died in the houses that were torched who could not get out. In the investigations as to the causes of the riots, the blame for the unrest was placed entirely at the feet of the Catholics. Right. The official government ruling blamed the Catholics. But when the church sued the city over the destruction of St. Augustine, the church won. St. Augustine was rebuilt in part with money won from the lawsuit against the city. So the Irish Catholics were officially to blame, but the city was financially responsible. Yes. Makes complete sense. Of course. So the riots of early May were over, but the tensions that gave rise to them did not subside. In late June or early July, the Catholics at St. Philip Neary Church, south of downtown, caught wind of a planned nativist rally nearby. A group of parishioners organized the defense of their church so it would not suffer the same fate as St. Michael and St. Augustine. They arranged to borrow 25 muskets from an armory, and they hid them in the church. Nativists living nearby happened to catch them hurrying some of the guns into the church, and they alerted their nativist fellows. The mob of thousands of nativists formed at St. Philip Neary on July 6th, but the militia arrived with cannons in time to prevent the church being stormed and the crowd dispersed. But the nativists returned the next day, July 7th, and this time with cannons of their own that they had taken from the docks just a few blocks away. Thus armed, they were more fit for a fight, and a fight it was. Hand to hand, musket and pistol fire, both sides fired their cannons. The result was 20 dead, most of them on the nativist side. Parrish had to give up its guns, but it was spared the torch. And once again, the official report on the riot placed the blame on the Catholics, accusing them of being the main instigators. Nothing really came of this violence. Anti-Catholicism as a political platform would continue into the 1850s, with nativists winning elections here and there. Discriminatory practices and more violence was visited upon Catholics for years to come, 
But in spite of that, Catholics would continue to rise in social and political circles. But while the riots were unfolding, Bishop John Hughes, 80 miles away in New York, was paying attention. He also had been dealing with nativists and the issue of the Protestant Bible in the schools, and he also had a burgeoning Irish Catholic population. As he watched, he was taking notes on what to do and also what not to do when the mob comes calling, lest what happened in Philadelphia happen to his city. But we'll tell that story another time. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help us out by giving us a five-star rating and a good review. And we ask you to consider supporting the work of SQPN. Yes, now is a great time to become a StarQuest patron. Thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter, when you start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor. So if you become a new patron at $10 per month, after three months, our donor will give $30 to StarQuest to support all of our shows, including American Catholic History, making your gift go even further. If you've been thinking of becoming a StarQuest patron, now is the time. Visit sqpn.com slash give today. To learn more about the 1844 nativist riots, to find previous episodes, or to learn about our upcoming pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country, please visit sqpn.com slash history. We also love feedback and hearing about great Catholic history sites and stories from all over. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. Dom, I'm going to do this one myself. I'm just going to read the whole thing myself. I'll even impersonate Noel. <laughs> so the motivation for using the Bible in public schools wasn't purely religious. All of a sudden, she became Julia Child. <laughs> <laughs> this is their first time out after the, <laughs> the, the quarantine, really. We've been quarantined. <gasps> okay. So the COVID fever is off, but the cabin fever is still pretty active. <laughs> ah. Okay. <laughs>